All right, so we're going to get started here. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out, and thanks to everybody who's returning. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of our uh, sponsors here. So obviously, Num Focus, we'd like to thank them for uh, sponsoring this monthly meetup, as well as TD Ameritrade, who is my employer, for offering up this uh, wonderful venue, uh, as well as to Midas for uh, supplying the food, the food for this meetup. Uh, if you are, if you work here, if you work at University of Michigan, or you you interact with people over at Midas or at uh, meet non-focused people at Pi Data events, please do thank them as well. A couple of important points for people who are new here. Uh, emergency exits. There's one right behind this uh, whiteboard here. As well, uh, if you walked out these uh, doors that you came through, on the right-hand side, right before the elevators, there's stairs that go down. Uh, we're always looking for uh, uh, speakers in the future. We do have a great lineup lined up uh, all the way out until November, maybe December. But we're always trying to get ahead of that because it always makes me nervous when I don't have people uh, lined up. It uh, gives me less anxiety. But also, uh, please provide any feedback. Things that we're doing uh, great, not so great. Uh, things that we can do to improve the diversity and inclusion. That would be fantastic as well. Um, we're always open to hearing. You can email me, message me on the Meetup group. Uh, also, unless you have uh, quick questions, try to please hold them until the end. I'm sure that uh, we have a lot of engaged uh, people here. Uh, but let's try to keep the keep the long ones until the end. And also remember that we're in a borrowed space, so try to uh, clean up after yourselves, your plates, your cups. Uh, the garbage cans are over by where the food is. I'd like to quickly go over our short version of the Pi Data Code of Conduct. So Pi Data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free conference experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size race or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of conference participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any conference venue, including talks. Be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi Data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the conference without a reef without uh, uh, any uh, further um, explanation. And it is at the sole discretion of the conference uh, or the meetup organizers. But overall, thank you for help making this a welcoming and friendly environment for everybody. If anybody does encounter any problems, please do, to, do let me know. Uh, quick icebreaker. So I'm, I tried to come up with one earlier, and maybe the backstory is that I found poison ivy at my house. Ooh. So I want to know if, uh, turn to somebody to your left, or to your right, it, hopefully someone that you haven't met before, introduce yourselves and tell them whether or not you've experienced the effects of poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, any of that. So. No. I have. I All right, welcome back. Thank you. So hopefully, uh, you know, the talk's going to be great, but hopefully you will have met somebody that you have not met before, uh, and uh, you learned something new. Uh, this month in data science, uh, I'd like to plug this. Uh, if you, anybody is interested in podcasts, especially in the data science realm, this is a great new podcast uh, called Data Framed. Uh, coming out uh, from the folks over at Data Camp, which is a, a, a data science uh, online training courses. Uh, we're actually going to have the, uh, we've invited the, uh, I guess, uh, interviewer of Data Frame to come give a talk in the fall. So uh, Hugo Bowden Anderson. So that's going to be a, a lot of fun. But definitely check out this, uh, this podcast. It comes out on a weekly basis and interviewing sort of uh, data scientists from different backgrounds, whether it's academia, industry. Uh, so uh, give it a listen. 
Uh, also, TD Ameritrade is hiring. So if anybody is looking for either uh, a position, uh, speak to Logan Alstrom. I think he's floating around somewhere. Uh, he might be in the back there. Uh, so definitely go talk to him. So they're looking for data scientists, whether it's junior or senior positions, as well as data analysts on their team. And I also want to point out a new meetup. There's uh, our, our friends over in Toronto, which is where I, where I came from, uh, has a, they just started the PyData Toronto meetup group. So go check them out if you're ever in the area. And last but not least, I'd like to plug our next event. Uh, so on Thursday, July 19th, we have Skipper Siebold coming from Civis Analytics uh, from Chicago. And uh, he's, get, he's gonna be talking to us about what's the science in data science. Uh, so please do sign up and come out to that event. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today. It is uh, Leland McInnes, who uh, hails originally from New Zealand, but is now currently working in uh, Ottawa, Canada, so another fellow Canadian. Uh, and he works at the uh, Tut Institute. And today he's gonna be telling us about dimensionality reduction. And so I've, I, I met uh, Leland a couple of years ago, and uh, we should be learning a lot today. All right. Uh, good evening. I want to say thank you, first of all, to uh, Sean and the organizers of, of this event. It's really great to get invited here. Uh, you have had many, many very eminent speakers in the past, and I am uh, very flattered to uh, get the invitation. So uh, PCA, TSNE, and UMAP is what I'm going to be talking about today. But first of all, who am I? So I'm a researcher and mathematician from the Tut Institute for Mathematics and Computing. My PhD was in something you do not care about. It is bizarre, pure maths. The takeaway here is that I'm really a mathematician. I'm, I'm not actually a machine learning guy. I work with a lot of really awesome people, some of whom do know machine learning really well, and so I get to work with them, and together we can build a great team that actually does useful stuff. So. Uh, that, that's the background. So what is dimensional reduction? And why would you want to do it anyway? So the core idea of dimensional reduction is to find the, the latent hidden features in your data. There's this idea that there should be some, some background features that tell you something about your data. So what does that mean? Well, feature engineering is another way to think about it. And that's a really important task. Finding the, the core features that are important is how to think about it. Or if you reduce down to two dimensions, you can visualize with a scatter plot. Uh, so visualization, feature engineering, these are important tasks. And this is why some of the reasons you'd want to do dimensional reduction. So here is an example of the first hundred of the uh, MNIST digits data set. They're handwritten digits. So they are 28 by 28 pixel grayscale images of handwritten digits. Now, if you take each digit, you can unfold that 28 by 28 matrix into a 784 dimensional vector. Now, the key here is that I shouldn't really need 784 dimensions to be able to describe digits. There should be some smaller latent space that can describe these digits efficiently without having to use all 784 dimensions. Here's another example we're going to be working with. Here are... Uh, Images from Fashion MNIST. This is meant to be a drop-in replacement for the MNIST digits data set that is a little more challenging than MNIST, because to be honest, uh, it's, it's kind of a, an old and tired data set by this point. Uh, so these are images of fashion items like uh, shoes, T-shirts, uh, bags, and so on. And again, these end up being 784 dimensional vectors. And really, we shouldn't need that many dimensions to describe this data. So that's, that's the, the core here. So the next thing is, how does one go about doing dimensional reduction? And really, there's actually only two ways. You either do it by a matrix factorization or by neighbor graphs. Now, how you do these things is what matters. Matrix factorization really means a whole slew of different specific algorithms, principal component analysis, linear autoencoders, even word to vec and glove for text embedding amount to matrix factorization. What it comes down to is what matrix you construct a factor and the sort of loss and regularization you use to do that matrix factorization. But really, there's one core technique here, and that's matrix factorization. The same is true for neighbor graphs. There's a whole slew of different algorithms. What graph do you construct? How do you weight the edges if you're going to weight the edges? How do you lay out that graph in low dimensions? These are all options, and they all lead to slightly different algorithms. And there are a whole slew of different algorithms, but they all come down to the same core thing which is really building a graph and then embedding that graph in a low space. 
Okay, so to start with, let's look at principal component analysis because this is the prototypical matrix factorization algorithm. And I'm going to talk about it in a way to try and highlight the similarity of it to sort of more general matrix factorization. So uh, on that front, I, I want to give a shout out. There's a great paper called Generalized Low Rank Models by Udell et al. Uh, go read that paper. It is a great paper on general matrix factorization techniques for dimension reduction. If you want to do dimension reduction via matrix factorization, it goes through and provides a cohesive singular view of pretty much all the different techniques out there in one simple framework. So that's just an aside, but go look at that paper. So PCA is an old algorithm. It's been around for a long time. It's the old workhorse of dimension reduction, but it's still around and it's still doing an important job and it's still inspiring new algorithms today. So one can view it as trying to reconstruct data as a linear combination of some small number of prototypes. So writing that as an equation, here's this thing, and I want to minimize this. What, is, what does that mean? What's going on here? Well, this is the input data. So xij is the value of the jth feature of the ith sample. So that's some number. And then over here is my approximation to that. So uh, u is actually the low dimensional embedding that we're going to use. That's going to be our result. And v is this sort of matrix of prototypes, if you like, that we're going to build linear combinations of. The matrix multiplication there that we're doing, u times v is matrices, just basically is a shorthand notational way of doing this linear combination. And then as a whole, we're saying here's the reconstruction error. This is the amount of error. I'm going to multiply u times v. I'm going to get some linear combination of prototypes. And how close is that to the original data? And I'm just going to take that as the squared error. And when we try and minimize this, that's what PCA is doing. Now, if you change how you measure the error or other things, you can get all kinds of other different algorithms. But PCA is really about minimizing this reconstruction error. So what does that look like in practice? In pictures, here's some data. It's in two dimensions. What we're going to do is reduce this data to two dimensions. Yes, we can actually do that. We can go from the same dimensions to the same dimensions. It's, it's OK. It'll be a nice pictorial way to see what's going on. So one of the nice things about uh, this form here is it has a closed form solution. I said it was a minimization problem. I wanted to minimize this. We could do that via an optimization process, but there's a via linear, linear algebra, a closed form solution that just tells you what the answer should be. So what we're going to get out as the closed form solution is that the Vs are going to be the directions of maximal variance. Those are going to be the prototypes that fall out of this. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, if you want to find the prototypes that are going to be the best to describe your data in terms of vector directions, the best direction to describe your data is the, the maximal variance direction. And then once you've taken care of that one, what's the next best thing? Well, the next direction of maximal variance orthogonal to that, and so on. So those are going to be our prototypes. So we can think of those as just vectors in our space. And then given some point of our data, we're going to project that onto those v vectors to get u1 and ui1 and ui2 which are our low dimensional embedding values. So those are going to be the, the, the values of our reduced dimensions. Sorry, is the mic being weird here? No? OK, good. Um, so this is what you get out as a result. Now, we didn't actually do anything here because we were going from two dimensions to two dimensions. So it looks the same, except we rotated it out. But the same process would hold if we started with 1,024 dimensions and went to, it's just we wouldn't perfectly reconstruct the data anymore because our approximation, we only have two prototypes to work with. It's kind of sticking a linear plane through those 1,024 dimensions and projecting onto that. OK, so how about doing that on real data? So let's try it on MNIST digits. I showed you some of the digits. Here's 70,000 of them projected into two dimensions with PCA. And you can see that it actually has done a good job here. I've, I've colored the, the points by the digit that they were. Um, so on the far left, uh, you see the ones. On the far right, you can see the zeros. And that's your sort of 
maximal variance direction. And then in the other direction, you've sort of got 7 and 9 and 4, down to 2 and 3 and 6, sort of. It's a bit smeary, but you can see. And the key here is that the global structure of the data has been preserved, even though we've only projected down to two dimensions. Starting with 784, we've projected to two dimensions, and we still know an awful lot about this data. If we went to a larger number of dimensions, say 10, it would still work really well. In fact, it would be better. And this is the key, is that we can project down to a very small number of dimensions and still retain a lot of information about the data. Oh, we can do it on fashion MNIST as well. It looks pretty similar. Again, we have sort of major directions. It's sort of footwear across to everything else, and then trousers up to everything else, and then bags at the top there, the blue you can see. Okay, so how about t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding? So in 2008, TSE came along and set a new bar for dimension reduction for visualization purposes. There were a whole bunch of algorithms that had come out in the 2000s, ISOMAP and Friends, but TSNE came along and was so much better than all of them that pretty much everyone ended up converting pretty quickly. Now, TSNE is usually explained in terms of probabilities and some sort of uh, probability-based uh, approach, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take a different approach. Uh, I'm going to explain it a different way, and it's going to lead to algorithms like UMAP, which I'll be discussing later, and for which TSNE was an inspiration. So I claim that TSNE can really be viewed best as a graph-based algorithm instead. Uh, I'm going to skip probabilities and go straight to graphs. So let's build a directed graph. <coughs> and for the vertices, I'm going to have the data points that I start with that I want to reduce the dimension of. So here's a picture. Uh, so I'm going to start with the point in the middle, and I'm going to draw directed edges to all the neighboring points. Now, if I just keep doing this, I'm going to end up with a directed graph that's a complete directed graph that has all the possible edges that could ever be, and that's not very informative. But if I instead weight the edges using an RBF kernel, radial basis functions, so that essentially we're going to decay, so smaller weights get applied to points that are more distant from each other, then I would get something like this if I just drew the edges from that central point where I'm shading them by effectively the weight. So lower weight for the more distant points. Now, how do you choose the bandwidth of that kernel? Well, we can vary that per point based on sort of an information theoretic measure is what TSNE actually uses, but it's not worth getting into the details. It's better to say that that sort of correlates essentially with the distance to the kth nearest neighbor if you like, or you can think of it as related to the total weight that would be applied to a given outgoing vertex. Okay, so next we're going to normalize all the weights at each vertex so that the total outgoing weight from the vertex is just one. Uh, why would you want to do this? Well, it's going to even things out that weren't caught by that bandwidth variation trick we just did. So we would end up with something that looks a bit like this. I'm not going to draw all the edges because it would just be too difficult to visualize. Um, but we're going to end up with different weight edges, and there are going to be some incoming and some outgoing. So between each pair of points, there's going to be a pair of edges. And importantly, those pair of edges are going to have different weights because of the different kernel bandwidths we applied to each point and the fact that we did that uh, normalization so that everything summed to one independent for each point. So what we'd like to do is convert that to an undirected graph by just averaging the weights between pairs of vertices. Now, we could take the average, but if you think about it, we could, we could do the max, we could do the min, we could do the product, we could do the geometric mean. There's a lot of options, but with no other motivation, the arithmetic mean seems like a perfectly sensible thing to do, so we're just going to do that. And then we're going to normalize all the weights on the graph so the total weight of all the edges in the graph sums up to 1. Now, that doesn't seem a terribly obvious thing to do, but it is, in fact, critical, and we'll see why in a bit. So we're going to end up with something like this. It's going to be an undirected graph with weighted edges. Now, what do we do with that? Well, suppose we had a proposed low-dimensional embedding of airpoints. We could use a similar process to build a weighted graph of those points in the low dimensional space that we want to embed into. We're going to have some differences, though. Uh, this is just how TSNE works. 
First of all, we're not going to use that RBF kernel anymore. We're going to use a T distribution kernel. And that's because it has a slightly different shape and it's going to help with crowding of points. We're going to fix the bandwidth for all the points with the high dimensional data. For each data point, I chose a different kernel bandwidth. Instead, I'm going to choose one fixed kernel bandwidth and have it for everything. And that has the advantage that it means that the whole thing can be considered an undirected graph from the start because uh, the edge weights will be equal in either direction. So I don't need to care. The average will work out to be whichever one I choose. And why did we choose these particular things? It's because they work well is really the answer. I don't have any good answers for why these particular choices were made. Now, we want to build a low dimensional representation that gives a graph that matches as closely as possible to the graph we build in the high dimensional case. That's really all that's going on here. So, if we take a reconstruction error of, of this, which is a, an oddly chosen looking thing, from a probability theory point of view, uh, where the original authors built the algorithm, this was an entirely sensible choice. Uh, for the graph-based approach, it looks odd, uh, but it works. So the WH here is the weight of the edge in the high-dimensional graph. The WL is the weight of the edge in the low-dimensional graph. Now, the goal is to minimize this error. Now, if you think about it, the WH is fixed, because we have our fixed high-dimensional graph. And if we're going to optimize, we're going to move the points around low dimensional space to try and minimize that error. We could minimize it by basically making WL as large as possible. Now, given the nature of the kernel, that means setting everything to one. That would be fine, except for the fact, well, what would that mean? That would mean we put everything at distance zero from each other. So stick all the points on top of each other. Except we have that normalization step where we're going to make the total weight of the graph sum to one. So if I stick everything on top of it, each other, then I'm going to average that out so everything gets the same very low weight. And in fact, I'm going to get a bad reconstruction error in that case. So in practice, what's actually happening there is that normalization step is providing a kind of universal repulsive force among the points. You can't squash them too close together to each other unless the weight on the high dimensional edge is really large. So in practice, that means we have an attractive force wherever the weights on the high dimensional edges are large and a repulsive force sort of just universally among the points. So really, this is a force directed graph layout. If you've ever done force directed graph layouts, this is what that is. It's just force directed graph layout for a particular choice of how to do that force direction. So that's how it works. How well does it work in practice? Well, here's MNIST digits with TSNE, and you can see immediately the difference to PCA. PCA had a big smear of different colors. Here we've picked out each and every digit pretty cleanly into nice distinct groups. So essentially by focusing on the local structure, uh, it's managed to uh, understand the latent structure of the digits far better than PCA could. PCA was focused on global structure. Here we're focusing on local structure and we've captured far more information. Similarly, for Fashion MNIST, uh, some of the classes are a little jumbled there, but largely it's, it's pulled all the classes apart really cleanly and it's understood a great deal about the data. So even only projecting to two dimensions, we've understood a lot about all those images of fashion items. Okay, so on to uniform manifold approximation and projection, UMAP which is an algorithm I, I created with some of my colleagues at the Tut Institute as an attempt to build something TSNE-like, but with a firmer mathematical foundation. There was all that graph-based approach that I described as a way to understand the algorithm, but to some extent from that line of thought about how to build the algorithm, some of it was not as cl clearly motivated. So I wanted to motivate the steps that I was making. So UMAP builds a mathematical theory to try and justify this graph-based approach. So if we want to think of it in a graph-based way, how would we go about providing the math that justifies that? Now, for this talk, I'm going to gloss over the fancier math. It's not that the math is particularly hard, but it uses a kind of math and language that is probably less familiar to a lot of people, so it's not worth getting into the detail. 
The main thing is that we're going to have a rigorous theory that makes the decisions about what to do at various stages in the algorithm for me and makes it easier to generalize it to do other things and other problems. But first, a little bit of topological data analysis, because that's going to be the theory that we're going to use to justify everything we're doing. So the first thing is this notion of simplices. Now, in practice, we're not going to need really much of this at all, but the, the notion matters. So a zero simplex is just a point. A one simplex can be described by two points, and it is essentially the line that joins them. A two simplex is described by three points, and you get a convex hull, three simplex on up. The key here is that this is all purely combinatorial. There is no uh, uh, continuous space to deal with here. Everything can be described in purely finite combinatorial terms. And if you do topology, uh, then this is the way to deal with topological spaces for many ways, because it takes complex topological objects, which are all continuous and messy and hard to work with, and turns them into something simple and finite and combinatorial. So these are simplices. If you glue them together, you can get a thing called a simplicial complex. Now, the only real key here is when you glue them together, you have to glue them together along the faces of the simplices. You can't just stick them together randomly. But the result is that we can glue them together and make a thing that is a topological space. And the, the joy here for topologists is that in practice, you can construct almost any topological space out of simplices in this way. So you can describe almost all of topology in this combinatorial approach. Now, there are pathological topological spaces, but you're never going to encounter those with data. So it's not something we need to worry about. OK. This is a picture of a theorem. You don't need to read it. The main thing is that there is a theorem that happily says that we can go from a topological space to this simplicial complex description of it and that will capture all the information we need to understand that topological space well. And that there's a way to do this. And there's solid mathematical theory that's all very highfalutin and fancy that says that this works really well. Okay, so in practice, what's going on here? We can take some points, and I'm going to color code them by their position along a manifold, which they were noisily drawn from. Now I'm going to build a cover which basically means I'm going to cover the manifold in some ma manner. In practice, I'm going to place open walls of some fixed radius on each point. And now I'm going to take the nerve of that cover, which is really fancy math terminology for saying I'm going to stick an edge wherever those walls intersected pairwise. I'm going to stick a triangle wherever they triply intersected. I'm going to stick a tetrahedron wherever they quadruply intersected, and so on up. And that's a simplicial complex. That's, that's this gluing together of a bunch of simplices. And that theorem we had basically says, this captures the topology of the manifold. Now, if you look at this, it didn't perfectly capture that manifold that you probably mentally drew in and could see for yourself. It has gaps where it's not connected. And there are some parts there where it's probably you know, uh, a little clumpier than it should be. So what went wrong there? Well, if the data were uniformly distributed on the manifold, then that cover would be good. That's what went wrong. The data wasn't uniformly distributed. If we go back, there's you know, big spaces here where the data is spread out more. So here's a picture where I uniformly distributed the data on the manifold. And lo and behold, if we took the nerve of that, we would get a perfect graph that was aligned, and everything would look great. We would have understood everything. So all we need is for the data to be uniformly distributed on the manifold. But when is data ever that nicely behaved? It's just not. That's not how these things work. But as a mathematician, I get to assume whatever I like. So <laughs> let's assume the data is uniformly distributed on the manifold. Case closed. We're good, right? Not quite. There's, there's a converse side of this. If we say that the data is uniformly distributed on the manifold, that actually tells us something about the manifold. So here's where it gets a little fancy. We have to define a Riemannian metric on the manifold to make that assumption be true. That's kind of how it works. Now, this is slightly deeper math, 
But the key point here is that we're going to define a notion of distance that varies from point to point as we move across the data. So here's some quick primer on manifold theory. Um, what we're really doing is patching together uh, bits of, of, of data that look like normal Euclidean space. So this is how you build curved spaces in mathematics. You glue together bits of space that look flat. So there are these convenient maps from some local region of the space down to just normal Euclidean space. Now, what you need to take away from this is that what we're essentially going to do, in effect, is say, well, in some local patch, I'm going to say that the notion of distance is this. And in a different local patch, I'm going to map to Euclidean space in a different way so that I get a different notion of distance there. So you can do this with, you can push all the math through, uh, and uh, there's a paper online if you want to look it up, but you probably don't. Um, and what you get is this. This is, this is that same data, and now every single one of those uh, balls is in fact a unit ball. They don't look like unit balls because they're not unit balls in the ambient space, the background space. But according to the manifold, according to this varying notion of distance as I move from point to point to point to point, they are. And specifically, this is the notion of distance that is required to make these points be effectively approximately uniformly distributed. So we're doing the thing that recovers the assumption we need to make all the math work, and we're just having to change our notion of distance on the manifold to do it. And in the end, this looks a whole lot like k-neighbor graphs and other standard manifold learning techniques. But why choose a fixed radius? Why not have a, a fuzzy cover? Because there's some uncertainty here, right? Like, I said the data was uniformly distributed, and I got this notion of distance local to each point. But the further I get from the point, the less sure I am of that notion of distance, because I'm further away from where I was defining my notion of distance. So shouldn't we sort of have a fuzzy topology and a fuzzy cover, something like that? There are many ways we could do this. Again, here's a picture of a theorem. You don't need to worry about it. The point is that there is actually a whole bunch of deep underlying math that says explicitly how to do this. And in fact, it says that we can go from finite metric spaces to fuzzy simplicial sets, and that there's a fixed and defined way that that should be done correctly and takes care of all these details. So it's much more rigorous than all the hand-waving I'm doing here and works a little differently, but the intuition is the same that we can move to ending up with a fuzzy cover where now, instead of these fixed balls, they sort of fade out as they get further away from the point. And now we're doing something more than just a k-neighbor graph. We're making use of that local notion of distance because the way it decays depends on that local notion of distance. And if you think about it, this looks a lot like TSME with its varying bandwidths for kernels, except we have an math explicit mathematical justification as to why. We assumed that it was uniformly distributed on the manifold. That told us something about how to measure distance on the manifold. And now we've just taken a uniform cover with fixed radius balls that decay in the way that they have to according to the math. So one more assumption slips in uh, at about this point, which is that the manifold is locally connected. So this is, again, fancy math. But I'm not saying the manifold is all connected in one giant chunk. What I'm really saying is that there are no isolated points that are off all by themselves. Everything is connected to something. It might just be that there's two points that are connected to each other far away somewhere and not connected to everything else. But local connection is an important assumption to make. So what that means in terms of uh, our fuzzy cover here is you can think of it that we should be completely confident in our... Um, uh, cover out to the first nearest neighbor, and then after that, you can decay and uh, range off from there. Now, again, the fancy math that I had before actually makes all that explicit in terms of these adjunctions and how to do that properly, but the practical effect is that we actually get a greater range of distance for near neighbors. Now, here's the important part. Here's a distribution of distances to 20 nearest neighbors for a given data set where I pick things in two dimensions, if I put them in four dimensions, eight dimensions, 16 dimensions. And the key here is 
that the distribution of the distances to 20 nearest neighbors slowly but surely slides up this distance scale. So that if you were to try and, because really we want everything to end up here. So what you might do is divide out by the largest thing. If I do a multiplicative division type thing, I'm going to squash that distribution to get it near the origin, and it's going to be really, really, really tight. And I'm gonna, not going to have much variation in that distribution. What I'd really like to do is just slide it along, which is essentially subtract off the distance to the nearest neighbor. That'll slide it along to the origin, and we're good. So that's what this local connectivity assumption is doing for us in practice. It's motivated by a pure theoretical constraint. In practice, it provides real uh, difference for high dimensional data. The higher the dimension, the more important this becomes. But I skipped something. Our local metrics are all incompatible with each other. So here was the pretty diagram of the nice theory that was supposed to work. But these maps here, tau, that map back and forth between the sort of intersection of the two things, we don't have those. We never built them. The theory was we only had finite data, so we had to guess. But we don't know how that bit works, because that's, that overlap occurs where we don't have data. So where we don't have data, we don't know what to do. So instead of overlaps, we have disagreements. How do we cope with that? Well, in terms of the graph sense, we essentially end up with multiple edges with different weights joining two points, which should sound a lot like what TSNE had. So the trick is that in error case, we can think of this as trying to glue together a whole family of different metric spaces that all disagree with each other. There's one for each point. And how do we glue them all together? And again, that's where this uh, nice theorem, that's again, picture of a theorem, tells us exactly what to do. Because what we are essentially doing is translating everything over to this fuzzy simplicial set land where everything's combinatorial and nice, and we know exactly what to do. We just union them all together. And so under a probabilistic fuzzy union, the combination of weights on edges is given by not the arithmetic mean of them, but their sum minus their product, which looks a little weird. But if you think of this as the probability of an edge existing is what the weight attached to an edge is, then what this is really saying is the, this, this combined value is the probability of either this edge or this edge existing. It's just the or of the two probabilities. So it, it makes a lot of sense. And in practice, it works. We end up with a nice weighted graph. But equally importantly, we have the theoretical justification for why we should build this particular graph and why it should look like this. Now, suppose we were given a low-dimensional representation, much like TSNE. We could apply the same process to get a fuzzy graph. Except for a couple of things. First, we know what the manifold is. I don't have to do this uniform uh, approximation trick because I know what the manifold is. I want to project it into Euclidean space. So I know my manifold is Euclidean space. I'm done. I know how to measure distance there. That's all. But I don't know what the correct nearest neighbor distance is. We had that local connectivity assumption that we were told by the data what that was. When I'm in the low dimensional space, I don't know what that should be. So I'll have to pick that as hyperparameter. And so now we just measure the distance between these graphs using cross entropy, and then we optimize. So here's the cross entropy formula. But really, we're just embedding the graph. It's just a graph layout. It's a force-directed graph layout, just kind of like TSNE, but a little different. So you can think of it this way. This is the get the clumps right term. And this is what TSNE had. That looks a whole lot like the TSNE term. But this, this term over on the right, TSNE didn't have that. And that's the get the gaps right term. That's a repulsive force, but it's a, a, a global repulsive force that works depending on the values of the data, rather than the uniform repulsion that TSNE had by the normalization trick. <laughs> and the important point is that by not normalizing the edges uh, the way TSNE does to generate the repulsion, this is all actually much more computationally tractable. So here's the graph embedding we get out from that, and then we would end up with this as our embedding in the space, which is not exactly perfect, but we did pull out the line fairly accurately. 
and then there's the weird gaps there. And if you actually look at the, the data here, uh, what actually caused that? Well, there's a dense area of points there and a dense area of points there, and that really messed up our uniform distribution assumption because there was a little more density than would be expected. And that would be solved if we just had more data that it would iron out some of those kinks. So more data would remedy this. So what does this crazy math algorithm look like on real data? Here's MNIST digits. And so, again, like TSNE, we've picked out all the digits really cleanly, but we've also captured the same global structure that PCA did. We've got the ones on the left, the zeros on the right, and we've got groups, 479 up high, 853 in the middle, that are similar looking digits, and it's grouped them together independently. It's captured global structure and local structure together. Here's Fashion MNIST. And again, we picked out all the different groups, as well as TSNE, but unlike TSNE, it separated off pants and footwear as being quite far away and distinct from the other groups. This is, this is important. We captured the global structure and the local structure. All right, so implementing this, is this actually tractable to implement all this crazy math? So when you really boil it down, what we need to do is find approximate nearest neighbors really, really efficiently, even in high dimensional space. But fortunately, random projection trees and nearest neighbor descent are two algorithms that are already out there and published that will tell you how to do this well. We would also need to optimize the layout and do so in a sub-quadratic algorithm. That's fine. Stochastic gradient descent and the negative sampling tricks used in word to vec in fact, are exactly the tools you need to do this. Again, standard published tools, we just use them. It needs to be built in a high level language, but still be fast. So I'm not really a programmer. I'm a mathematician. I can't write good code. But Python lets me write code that looks much more like math. I can write Python, at least. I can't write C++. But Numba, which is a, a library that compiles Python code down into LLVM, lets numeric Python go blindingly fast. So I actually can't say enough good things about Numba. This was my first project where I really, really used Numba in anger. And it is awesome. It is amazing. There is nothing like it. You should try and use it for your code, honestly. So what does it mean? Well, you get high performance, like C-level performance out of your code, but your code is just really clean, simple Python. It doesn't look like the messy Scython stuff. If you've ever dealt with Scython, it's really clean, really simple, and it allowed me to do crazy things, like allow users to provide custom distance metrics and have it run just as fast as the distance metrics that I happen to write. So you can, you can write code in Python yourself, and as long as you can attach a number.jit at decorator at the top of your function, you can hand it to my code, and it'll run still just as fast as ever. And that's actually an amazing feat, because I have no idea how to do that in Cython. I have no idea how to do that in C++. In C++, I'd say, OK, write your function. Now recompile my entire library from scratch with your code included, and hopefully it'll work. OK, so how about a performance comparison? So uh, this is comparing against state-of-the-art multi-core TSNE. Uh, the sklearn TSNE is a little slower than this, so this is even better. So uh, the COIL 20 data set, TSNE took about 20 seconds. UMAP can do it in seven seconds. But you know, as we scale up, the difference gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The Google News data set, that was 200,000 word vectors from Google News, took four and a half hours for TSNE to do. Uh, UMAP did it in 14 minutes. So, you know, in terms of speeding scale up, that's like 3x, 13x, 11x, 19x. The larger the data set you get, get the more speed up you're getting. It's, it's asymptotically faster. So for all 3 million word vectors from that Google News data set, UMAP managed to do that in just a couple of hours. It took TSNE several days to run. All right, so where next? So the key here is that given the mathematical foundation, we have a whole bunch of mathematical rigor that tells us how to do everything and describes good theory, a number of options start opening up for being able to do more than what TSNE did or <clears throat> sorry, a standard dimension reduction techniques can do. 
So we can embed new unseen points into an existing embedding. So if we have a fashion in this train data set, we can take the test set and embed that into the existing embedding just fine. Uh, that means you can implement this transform method as part of an sklearn pipeline and use it as part of standard machine learning techniques rather than just as a visualization tool. And here's a fun one. This was actually why I originally started working on UMAP. I had an idea for how to do this, and it, I ended up creating UMAP to try and get the theory right to be able to do this. Make use of labels for supervised dimension reduction. So here's a fun thing. Fashion MNIST comes with labels. All those images are labeled. I'd like to do a dimension reduction that understood what those labels were and yet still did something meaningful. So here's Fashion MNIST embedded by UMAP using that label information. So now, even those classes that were previously muddied and uh, mixed together, it splits those out perfectly because we gave it the label information so it knows how to split them apart. But it still captured the internal structure of all those bits and pieces. The, the green and light orange here still has that weird banding structure that was actually evident in the original plot. And everything works just as it would, and we still captured the global structure as well. The relative position of the different clumps is pretty much the same. So given the label information, we can actually embed even more informatively. And better yet, we can combine both of those things. Why not do both? What if we had an embedding uh, into a metric space using label information and then have some new unlabeled points? Can we embed those into that space? So yes, we can. Here's the Fashion MNIST training data set embedded using the label information so that all the classes are very cleanly split out. And then I can take the test set and embed that using the same technique as before. And there are some errors there. You know, there's some red mixed in with the green, but it mostly did a really good job. And if you compare that with uh, triplet networks, which are sort of current state of the art for something like metric learning, uh, it, it compares pretty favorably. While triplet networks do a pretty reasonable job, they have some of the same sorts of errors that the UMAP approach was doing. But what UMAP did was it still captured the internal structure of all of those different classes and that internal interesting fine detail structure, which the triplet networks just don't do. Now, you can think of using that label information as adding one categorical variable, the label, in theory, that's no, it's no harder to just add in a whole bunch more. So, in fact, we can combine spaces with different metrics. So if I have some continuous data and some categorical data, I already combined those. That was the label information. I could have continuous data as long as I can measure a distance. It might be ordinal. I could use a Haversine metric. If I have a sparse Levenstein, I could do string distance. There's all sorts of things. As long as you can measure a distance, you can fold these things together. So as long as you can provide a metric for the data type, UMAP can combine them together with other data types. So at least in principle, I haven't written all the code to do this yet, UMAP for pandas data frames would just work. You have a general pandas data frame with general data, and as long as you can tell it how to measure distance for each of those different data type columns, It'll just embed all of them into a single vector space in a convenient way, and you can visualize generic data frames. So, uh, conclusions. PCA is interpretable dimension reduction. That's the thing to take away. That uh, measure of uh, maximal variance for your prototype directions, that means when you plot a PCA plot, the dimension, the axes actually mean something. Those are the directions of maximal variance. And that's a really important thing. Interpretable machine learning matters. And if you need an interpretable dimension reduction, PCA is the way to go. Um, TCD is just awesome. Uh, UMAP is even more awesome. And there's still a whole lot more to do on all of these things. I'm just getting started with some of these further ideas that we can work on. So collaborators are welcome. If you're interested, come and talk to me afterwards or get a hold of me, file an issue on GitHub, or uh, reach me on Twitter, and uh, we can try and work together to extend this even further. Thank you.
So uh, you make the assumption that uh, that the data are, are evenly distributed along the uh, manifold, and then you construct a manifold that matches that assumption. Yeah. How do you actually do that? Um, in practice, the uniform uh, distribution assumption can be converted into uh, a means to approximate the volume form of the manifold. And under suitable assumptions, uh, given the volume form, you can actually derive the complete Riemannian metric uh, local to that data point. I mean, it varies across as you go. But it, it's really a matter of, of essentially approximating the volume form given the distribution of data that you have. Yeah. Question for you. I was thinking about your uh, MNIST example, where yes. you're essentially kind of rasterizing it. Uh, when you throw the dimensionality reduction, something like that, one of the arguments for use of continents is that you actually retain the positional information. Does that matter? Do you lose information, or how do you get around that? Um, Convenets would definitely preserve more information. I mean, uh, we're talking about image data there, uh, and yes, the relative position, like I, I'm losing the vertical relative positioning. Uh, when I unfold it into the long vector. And I, I would say uh, the interesting thing is that even without anything as fancy as confnets, we can recover a huge amount of information about the actual structure regardless. So uh, confnets would uh, manage to come up with things you will not manage to get out of this. But uh, on the other hand, you could pair this with confnets, uh, have a convolutional net, um, and just strip off the last few layers. That gives you A, an embedding, and then you can embed that down to two dimensions with UMAP further. So I've seen, for example, people have used TSE and UMAP to take uh, images and embed images into two dimensions using a, a layers of a convolutional net as, as sort of an intermediate step. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's a point in the latent space, how you convert that into a data UMAP? Um, I have a theoretical way that that can be done, I have not worked through. <clears throat> sorry, have not worked through all the details to ensure that that can actually work in practice. But if you're interested, come discuss with me later, and maybe you can implement it. <laughs> Chuck, what's an example of how to tell it to me how to measure distance? So intuitively, I'm thinking that a dress is more like a coat than it is like shoes. But do you tell it a quantitative number? Tell it how to measure distance, or you say all you have to do is tell it how to measure distance. So what does that mean? Um, so in that particular case where where I had the the, the coats and the shoes and the dresses, uh, I'm literally taking the image and just stretching it out into a vector and measuring Euclidean distance between those vectors, which. Uh, as the the other person noted, you know, convolutional nets will do a whole lot more for you than that. Uh, what's remarkable is how much can be achieved with something as simple as this. Um, if you pair it with convolutional nets, that would give you sort of more interesting ways to measure distance that take some of those sorts of factors into account. This question in the back on the left. Yeah, that's right in the middle. Yeah. Um, on the resulting graphs where you showed how it split up, could you give a notion of what the position means? Um, which one? So, any of, yeah. What, this one? Could you give a notion of what the position means on that graph? Um, you mean in terms of the, what the axes mean? Sure, yeah. Uh, no. No, no, that's explicitly what you don't get with both TSNE or UMAP. Um, PCA has interpretable axes. The axes mean something. Uh, with these approaches, these axes have no meaning. They are just, if I put the data down into two dimensions, this is a way that would make it look as close as possible to the, the actual structure of the, of the data. But the, the axes themselves have no inherent meaning. So projection? Sort of? Yeah, it's just a projection. Okay. Yeah. So I kind of have a follow-up. So say you do this, um, and then you want to figure out why pants are pants. Um, <laughs> which approach would you take to that? If you've already done UMAP, you have your clusters, but then you want to figure out kind of what features in the data led to it being classified as pants. Um, so that actually leads us to one of the other questions, uh, which was, could I take something in the latent space and uh, find the original data that would correspond to that? And that's presuming one had that algorithm in place. That's how you, that's essentially one way that you would do it. You would look at the sort of 
points in the region of pants and say, well, what do these look like in the high dimensional space? And then you'd basically do an analysis on the generated data of that for what are the features of this that are leading to this. So it, it's a non-trivial process at this stage, but uh, it's conceivable. <laughs> Uh, what kind of distance metric are you using when you have a categorical variable like the label? Like, there's not, like, the leverage distance between the names labeled and labeled. It's like, when it's, like, just a label. When it's just a label, uh, the measure of categorical distance is, is basically, well, if you had a suite of categories, you could use jacquard or dice. When you have a single category, you get a distance zero when the categories match and a distance of pick a number uh, when the categories differ. And it's just just that. There's really only a couple distances. Uh, could you give uh, uh, more information in terms of the uh, feature space? How many features can you have? Because I know that even with the HDB scan, just the performance, right? If you have too many features, then you mm -hmm. run into dimensionality, crystal dimensionality. Yeah. Um, I have successfully run UMAP on something with 50,000 features. Uh, sparse data, <laughs> not dense, uh, but it will run with sparse matrices. So you can go up pretty high dimensional. It's slower as soon as you have the sparse, but it's still manageable and you can run it. Um, and so actually the, the other side of that coin is uh, what dimension are you projecting into? So uh, when you're working with TSNE, you can project down to two dimensions. If you project to three dimensions, that's rather more expensive and you generally can't project to four dimensions, embed into four dimensions, or anything much higher than that. This is way too computationally taxing. Uh, it's exponential in cost in embedding dimension for TSNE. UMAP is linear in cost for embedding dimension. So you can embed into 20, 30, 50 dimensional space and then cluster there. Uh, and I've seen people do that, uh, where they decided that in fact 12 dimensions or so was the best embedding dimension to go to because they wanted to do clustering after that. Any last questions? Clayton, back. Have you tried, uh, have you tried UMAP on autocorrelated data like observations of time? I have not. That would be uh, intriguing. We should definitely chat later if, you're, <laughs> if you have such data. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll try to wrap up. But I want to also comment that while, while Leland says that he's not a, a program, he's a mathematician, I'd like to say that from what I've seen and in some of the other work that he's done, he's actually an exceptionally good programmer or developer, right? Uh, but with that, let's thank Leland again for making a trip out here.